Hi, everybody. This is Martin Pitella for Life Enthusiast Online Radio Network. Today with me, I have Spencer Feldman, I would say a dear friend by now. Spencer supplies us products through the brand Remedy Link, which you will appreciate. They are phenomenal detoxification and energy raising tools. But today, I thought we would try and explain that most of us are multifaceted human beings. Spencer is no exception. One of his facets is that he's a writer and he's written several ebooks that he has published on a website called Spiritual Secret Agent. And I'd like to ask him a few questions about that. Spencer Feldman, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Martin. Nice to see you again. Hey, you sound so low key as if you took some, um, I don't know what, some relaxing substances. Yeah, yeah. I've been working at trying to uh, keep my cool and stay relaxed. So, yeah. Oh, so this is actually intentional. You're just simply doing a, a cool dude thing, yes? No, it's just, you know, it's a meditative practice. You just try to remember that, you know, you're here to keep your calm and help other people and, I'm not get too thrown by things. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll get uh, the conversation to that part as well. Uh, oh, machines. What popped into my mind was uh, seven years ago, I got seduced by this advertisement that talked about uh, meditate like a Tibetan monk by this uh, gadget. And the gadget was some kind of a uh, uh, set of flashy LEDs that you put over your eyes and some kind of a, uh, sounds that you play into your ears. Yeah. So I brought it home, set it up, turn it on, and say, okay, show me what that's like. And so I so thought, well, okay, I'll try medium. I tried deep. I tried the ultimate. And I'm thinking, what's up? That's just regular meditation. I do this every day. Hmm. You know what you might like if you have a chance? Um, the Lucia light and sound machine. Uh, if you ever get in front of one of those, that's an interesting experience. That can definitely uh, put you into some uh, interesting states. But yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's just calming down your nervous system and you know, relaxing. Yeah. Well, I'm naturally keyed up, right? Like um, in my studies of uh, metabolic typing, I come across mm -hmm. the fact that some of us are in the acidic short twitch or fast twitch rapid response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more on the um, sympathetic side of things and others not so much they would be on the other side the more the parasympathetic the more yeah. relaxed the slower and of course most advertising these days is done in the um, keyed up hot to trot stress 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 respond now because if you don't you'll miss yeah. out on life yeah. Yeah. So, so we're talking to you right now. I'm finding it like, oh, okay, y'all. Uh, let me see. Maybe I could just ratchet it down a few notches. Well, um, you know, my attempt to ratchet it down initially was trying to figure out, you know, what parts of my life were uh, not working properly. And uh, the first thing was I, I did not have relationships figured out, Martin. So uh, I know you. Thought it might be interesting for us to talk about that. So, if you like, we can talk about that first book, which is uh, yes. my way of trying to resolve and unravel the whole relationship thing. Yes, that would be good. So, okay, let's just talk about Spencer Feldman, the writer, and the uh, and perhaps the lecturer or or seminar leader. And uh, anyway, I, I find it fascinating that you have decided to just give this away. People, this is just an unusual act of kindness and generosity where Spencer just pays it forward. So spiritual, spiritual secret agent .com, go there, you'll see three ebooks offered freely. And the first one was the four gifts, and the second one, an invitation to kingship, and third one, Purifying the Five Elements. Spencer, mm -hmm. which one did you want to talk about first? Well, you know, they, they happened in a sequence. So uh, I suppose we could talk about them in the same sequence. They were understood, mm -hmm. but I got to them. So 
All right. Um, most marriages don't work. You know, what's it? Fifty percent of marriages fail, right? And the ones that don't fail, a lot of them become sexless, or you know, they're just in it because it's too difficult to deal with what it, what the divorce entails, and there's kids. There are, of course, good marriages, but they're not as often as we'd like to see in our society. Uh, second marriages fail, fail more than first, and third marriages fail more than second, so it's not like we get any better at this. Um, there's a huge number of people, I don't remember the percentage, uh, that would cheat given the opportunity if they knew they couldn't get caught. So, You know, here's an interesting thing I'd like to stick in between what you're saying, which is, in my studies, I've come across that there are two kinds of people, the ones that value variety and the ones that value stability, and one will value intimacy and the other one not so much. So well, let's talk about why that happens, right? Because it's, you've obviously, you know, rec um, you're right, there, there is this need for variety. From a, I'm going to come at this from a neurochemical standpoint. Variety, you could say, is dopamine. It's novelty, right? There's a drive for that. So let's see if we can unravel what that is and how we can satisfy that in our partners and ourselves without necessarily having to break up a relationship. You know, what, what's going on? So this is what I came to. Uh, you know, in, in some parts of the world, like India, they still have arranged marriages. And uh, the bride and the groom may not even meet. The first time they meet could be at the wedding ceremony. And they're thinking, oh, gosh, what's this person going to be like? But we are all in arranged marriages, in a sense. And what I mean by that is it's arranged by our genetics. Uh, I'll give you an example of how this works. Let's say that um, a woman had... And in the, in the, just before the, the Black Plague, right, a woman had five children by five different men. That means each of her five children had a slightly different genetic setup. And her neighbor was with one guy and had five kids. Okay? There is a greater likelihood that the woman with five different children from five different men will have one of her offsprings survive the Black Plague than the one that had one, five kids with one man. Yes. Because there's greater genetic diversity. Yes. So just from an evolutionary standpoint, we are the descendants, the survivors of people who were more genetically diverse, who wanted that variety. That's how it codes in, because that's what won the war of evolution. Mm -hmm. People who, male or female, had the most variety in their sexual partners, had the greatest chance of passing on their genes and so forth. Therefore, we now have that. So are you actually saying that we're naturally pre-selected for wanting to be spreading yeah. our seed wide? Right. And it happens in different ways for men and women. We'll get into that. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, the word that comes to mind is the opposites attract. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So what we have is we've got the genes that are saying, hey, go sleep with as many different people as possible. Now it's, it's a balance between two things. The people who only, like for instance, a man who would um, sleep with a lot of different partners but not protect any of them, his offspring didn't survive as well because he might have had 10 kids, but if the woman, and we're talking you know, tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, where it was dangerous and a woman who's pregnant might not survive her pregnancy, you know, where she's vulnerable if there wasn't a guy with a spear and an ax by her side. So the guy who just slept with as many people as possible, not necessarily the best. The guy who slept with one woman, not the best. The guy who slept maybe with a few different women and stayed with them and protected them for a little while, his genes carried on, right? Now, of course, you've got things like Genghis Khan, you know, who raped God knows how many women and his genes are everywhere. But if you go back farther, um, to, I think that there's a, a balance between uh, family and promiscuity, and I think we're coded for that. So this is what I think happens, right? When you, the DNA wants us to make children with somebody, have the family unit stay functional for about two years, and then go on and make uh, kids with somebody else. Serial monogamy is basically what we're coded for, one person after another after another, but maybe a little variety. And I'm going to explain why I think that happens and how we can outsmart our DNA, which is playing this game on us. 
It does this by giving us a series of neurochemicals, Margie. The first one is PEA, phenylethylamine. It's two steps off away from methamphetamine. And like any amphetamine, it causes um, inability to think clearly and addictive behavior and pleasure. So mm -hmm. when we meet somebody for whom we are genetically matched, we both can, we call this the infatuation stage. If you're addicted to a substance, it's called dependence. But if you're addicted to a person, it's called codependence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it starts off, relationships start off with this very strongly addictive substance. And then it hangs around for about six months, long enough for the pregnancy to occur. And then it starts backing off. And it has to because junkies don't make good parents, right? So what happens is the next phase we go into is oxytocin. And now it's more loving and more sweet and more affectionate. And really, bonding. it's the family vibe, right? It's bonding, bonding and stability. Bonding, exactly, yes. exactly. And that hangs around for two years-ish. You know, some people get more, some people get less. And it's long enough to make sure that the baby is now a toddler. It can kind of function a little bit on his own. And then that starts to wear off. I don't have terrible twos. And then uh, the DNA says, okay, um, we need to switch gears again. We need to break this relationship up so we can have genetic diversity. The kid's old enough now, kind of move around on his own a bit. And then you get either cortisol or prolactin, which would be anger or hopelessness. So when I say that we're all in arranged marriages, that's arranged by the DNA. Now, in a traditional arranged marriage, you don't get to know the person until maybe the wedding, and then you, you get to know them. Genetically, you get to know the person in three stages. You know the PEA version of you and them together, the infatuation. That's the first third. That's really nice, right? very enjoyable. And people who think that's love, well, when that wears off after six months, they go and find somebody else. You know, they're PEA junkies. If they're not infatuated, they don't think it's love. Well, that's one kind of love, right? Um, and then you get to meet the next third of their personality, which is the oxytocin, the, the, the gentle, supportive, loving, kind, forgiving, all those great things. And then you get to finally meet the last third of their personality when the, DEA, uh, when the DNA starts creating separation signals. And then you get to meet the hopeless or the angry or the nasty side of somebody, the less evolved side of someone. <clears throat> so it's an arranged marriage in the sense you're not really meeting the person the entirety until a little later on. And so let me kind of express how these things play out in a <clears throat> kind of funny way. Let's say, let's say the man snores, right? And um, one woman talks to the other woman, she goes, oh, your husband snores. And the other woman goes, no, I, I've never noticed it. Right? When you're in PEA, you cannot see imperfections in your partner. They're just not or, or else you call it endearing. Well, it, well, that's the next stage. The first stage is you don't even see it. It's, it just you can't notice it. Right? The second stage is, hey, your husband snores. And he's like, yeah, that's adorable. Right? Isn't it wonderful? And then the third stage is, is your husband still snoring? Yes. And if he doesn't stop, I'm going to smother him with a pillow one night. Right, it's the same energy. It's the same thing the guy's doing, but the woman and the man's perceptions are changing more chemically because of the DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in love, out of love. Right. So, uh, what I want to talk about now is how we can kind of take the gears back, take control back of our neurochemistry and thus our perceptions and our feelings from the DNA. So, uh, let's start. Let's start with um, the oxytocin. Okay, this is the state that you can stay in the whole marriage long, right? You can't stay in PEA the whole marriage long, even if you could. And I'll, I'll show you some tricks to bring it back. Yeah. It's again, by the way, we actually have a supplement for oxytocin, it's nice. based on uh, an hops extract, mm -hmm. and yeah. it, it actually really kicks up the oxytocin quite effectively. Yeah, I've, I've sniffed oxytocin for six months. I was kind of taking it nasally three times a day. It was a um, very profound therapy for me. Uh, so, all right, a little bit about oxytocin. You're supposed to get your first oxytocin hit during childbirth. But if the mother is given a painkiller, which you know, a lot of women are, or cesarean, then there's no oxytocin rush that goes to the baby. There's supposed to be this rush that 
sets the baby and has the baby and the mama fall in love and tells the baby everything is safe and good and loved. If you have a difficult childbirth sequence, either from drugs or a cesarean or just a hard birth, and you don't get that, a person never really gets their oxytocin system set properly. Or if it was set properly, but they were traumatized in war or sexual abuse, it can get broken. So not everybody has their oxytocin system working, and sometimes you need to jumpstart it. Now, the way in which you can um, raise oxytocin, well, we learned that from the primates, right? Primates groom, uh, you know, an enormous amount of time, 10 times more than they need to for hygiene. So why are they doing it? Why are they constantly grooming? Well, if you study primates, you find out that the, the grooming, which is um, picking out, you know, twigs and bark and bugs and scratching and rubbing and stroking, uh, it raises oxytocin and it's how the, the primates maintain their, their bonding structure. So animals will um, stroke each other and, and apes will groom each other uh, as an apology, uh, as a way to strengthen bonds, as a way to curry favor. And think about what you're saying when, you, when you're an ape and, or a chimpanzee in the forest and you're grooming another one. You're basically saying, you're more important, I'd, it's more important for me to groom you than it is for me to eat, sleep, have sex, or watch out for predators behind my back. So you're really telling this animal you love it. You know, this reminds me of the act of service that we do, right? Like Seva, the mm. method by which we spend a lot of time serving others. Mm. It's sort of sublimated, right? It's not the same direct bonding experience, but it's, it's just the fact that we are there for the other person yeah. in that sense, yeah. right? So the first thing is um, to understand that oxytocin is a very short half-life. We're talking minutes. Uh, so in our disconnected society where everything is Facebook and, and even this conversation, right? Um, it's important that when you're in contact with your partner that you reach out and make physical contact, stroke. You're walking by your, your wife and she's in the kitchen, stroke her hair, give her a little hot chin on her butt, you know, give her a little rub on the shoulder, just let her know that you love her, you're touching her, you know, you're, you're bonding to her. You know, you're passing your, your, your husband's, you know, maybe doing some late night work over a computer, come by, run your fingers through his hair, you know, knead his shoulders a little bit. It's that constant physical contact that keeps the oxytocin going. And because it has such a short half-life, you, you know, it takes a lot of physical contact to, to keep it going. Um, so that's the oxytocin. Now, then there's the other two, right? Because remember, the, DEA, the DA, DNA doesn't want you to have kids with the same person over and over again. So they've got to get you to, to, to go elsewhere. And they do it by raising neurochemicals that either knock out your sex drive, which is prolactin, or make you a, a lesser version of yourself. So that either you don't mind cheating or the other person doesn't want to be with you which is cortisol, right? So if oxytocin is honesty and generosity and love and affection and forgiveness and kindness, cortisol is the exact opposite, right? If oxytocin is the angel on one shoulder, cortisol is the devil on the other. And it's the one that makes, I mean, we've all had cortisol, right? If you get hungry and you start getting irritable, that's cortisol. Um, when a woman's getting PMS and she gets really upset, that's cortisol, right? So we've all experienced it. Yeah. And the challenge with cortisol is it lasts a long time. Once it gets triggered, it's there for you there for hours. Yeah. So strange enough, again, I need to butt in here because we do have a herbal preparation that's called cortisol ease that actually discombobulates the cortisol in a fairly short amount of time. So if yeah. if people find themselves stressed or angry or just keyed up like as you're describing they can take a hit on this herbal and drop their cortisol levels yeah nice if they awesome. want to still keep that relationship going or else mm -hmm. give into it and ride the wave yeah phosphatidylserine will break down cortisol there's ways you can do it but the best thing to do is just not to make it right so uh here's the a couple of things about cortisol don't let yourself get hungry that's a surefire you know 
not everybody's going to react to it. But if you're the kind of person that gets hungry and gets irritable, that's cortisol. So, you know, be mindful of that. Um, what else can you do? If you're in cortisol, don't talk to your partner. If you're in cortisol and they're in cortisol, I know it seems like you really want to, you know, resolve whatever's going on right now. It's the worst time to talk to them. Just say, you know what? I, I'm spiking cortisol. You've got cortisol. If we talk now, it's going to be a fight. You know, I get that it's important that we, you know, um, talk about this, but not now. Let's, let's redress this again in an hour or so. So that's the key for cortisol. Don't talk when you're in cortisol. It's not going to turn out right. Even though, and that's, it takes a lot of discipline because you want to fight. You want to argue about it. Yeah. Now, the other one's prolactin. Not everybody goes through prolactin. That's more the, the, the um, that's where someone gets kind of sad and depressed and hopeless. And I'll, I'll explain this, you know, with the, a rat study, right? You put a rat in a cage and, it, and the rat doesn't like it. It's going to bite the cage bars and hiss and, you know, be angry. At a certain point in time, the rat's going to realize it's not getting out. It's called learned helplessness. And the cortisol drops down and prolactin comes up. That's like hopelessness. You put another rat in the cage and the two rats fight and then the, cort and the prolactin drops in the first rat because cortisol counters prolactin. If you ever notice, like, there's a, imagine you get an old couple, right? It's uh, Morty and Edith. <laughs> and, uh, and Edith goes to Morty and goes, Morty, what were we just arguing about? And, Edith, uh, and he goes, I don't remember, Edith. I don't know, what were we arguing about? And she goes, oh, I remember. I can't believe that you blah, 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 blah with the Beckensteins last night. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, and then you did. And they're back and forth, and they're bickering. Right? Why would anyone in their right mind want to be reminded about what they were fighting about? But they do, right? Well, I think this happens because cortisol feels better than prolactin. So the fighting gets them both out of the prolactin stage into the cortisol and anger feels better than depression. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, after all people people will have angry sex with one another, right? They will yeah, you get the makeup. Have, they will not the have sex. a despondent sex with one another. No, no, no. Prolactin lowers sex drive because the DNA thinks, hey, if I can't break up the relationship, at least I'll make sure you don't have any more kids until I can, you know, figure some way out of this. You can all, the other thing is for prolactin, you can also both drink a cup of coffee. It can raise cortisol and lower prolactin, so it can kind of shift you into that, and then you, you know, back off, and then you can work your way. But the idea is to get yourself back to oxytocin. So, because prolactin and, and cortisol have enormously long half-lives. So once we trigger them, they're in there for a while. So it's really important to understand what it is that triggers them in yourself and your partner and leave those things alone. Okay, so, You've got, the pro, you've got the phenylethylamine, you've got the oxytocin, you've got the, the prolactin. And let's kind of walk through what you might see. Like, let's say two people are fighting and they're both in cortisol. That's, you know, the tit for tat kind of fighting. Really, just walk away and come back later. Uh, you've got two people in prolactin. That's like the big chill. Nobody's talking. They've both got their backs turned to each other. Have a cup of coffee. You know, start arguing a little bit, get the cortisol up, then take a break and have some makeup sex. The one you'll often see also is one partner has prolactin and one is cortisol. This is where you'll see a dominant submissive kind of relationship, an abusive kind of relationship. One person is kind of bragging on the other and the other is just taking it, whether they're male or female, doesn't matter. And so what you have to do, you have to, um, you, know, you have to learn how to be provocable. And let me walk through this with you. It's a bit of game theory. There was a tournament, a computer tournament, I think in, 80, in the 80s by Professor Axelrod. And he pitted two computers, he pitted computer programs off against each other. He, you know, he told a bunch of programmers uh, the way the game would be played. And the way the game is played is two computers meet and they're going to go back and forth in a few rounds. And if each of them choose to be nice, they both get a point. If each of them chooses to be selfish, nothing happens. And if one is selfish and one is nice, the one that's nice loses and the one that's selfish wins big time. Uh, so he said, all right, build your programs, build your strategies to see who wins. And one program just wiped the floor with all the other programs, right? And it had a couple of different um, strategies to it. The first strategy is start by being nice. 
because if you're nice and the other program's nice, then you pass, you both get points. Second strategy is if another program is selfish to you, be selfish back the next round. You're being provocable, you're teaching it not to mess with you. Right? That way, uh, it won't take advantage of you. But then there was the third part, and it said, if you have both been stuck in a cycle of being selfish three times in a row, go back to being nice once. And it kept these vicious cycles from happening. And so what happened was, this program beat all the other programs because it could be nice when the other program was nice. It could be provoked into teaching the other program when it wasn't a pushover. And it could be forgiving. I'm saying, let's start over. So these are really the keys, right, for, for relationships. You start by being nice. When the other person's selfish, you call them on it, you're provocable, you're like, hey, you know, that's not really cool. I don't like the way in which you just treated me or spoke to me or what you did. And if you get stuck in a downward spiral, you gotta say, you know what, we're stuck in a downward spiral. We're playing tit for tat. How about we both forgive each other and start anew? And so that's like the way out of the cortisol prolactin. It's start by being nice, be provocable. You need a little bit of cortisol. You need to be able to respond to someone not being their best, right? And also be a little bit forgiving. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we get more into it into the book if you really want to get into the game theory of it. And now the last thing is PEA, phenylethylamine, because, you know, well, okay. Um, oh, I forgot this whole part. <laughs> the way in which men and women cheat is very different. It's there's um, hypergamy and polygamy. Now, could you say this? Or hy hy hypergamy and polygamy, right? Oh, okay. Man, polygamy is uh, like that's multi a man's partners. version. He wants as many women as he can get. And think about it, it's a very small investment for a man. It's a huge investment for a woman to get pregnant. You know, it, it's nine months with a baby. It's a dangerous, sometimes a possibly dangerous childbirth. It's breastfeeding. For a guy, you know, he, if he's not ethical, it's a minor investment. So for them, for a man, his strategy is to have as many partners as possible. A woman, her strategy is hyper, hypergamy. She doesn't necessarily want as many as a man does, but she wants the best quality. So a man might have a wonderful woman, but could, he, could still be attracted to another woman of the same or lesser quality just because it's that polygamy instinct going. A woman could be with a great guy, but if someone better comes along, the trigger, it could trigger that for him or for her. Or if the man she's with doesn't be, you know, somehow starts to lose some of his luster. You know, he's, he's unemployed, he's gaining weight, you know, whatever, getting a beer gut. She could be attracted to a better man. So for women, as a general rule, they want better, and men, as a general rule, want more. It's quality versus quantity. Now, how can we keep our partners satisfied and suppress these two um, instincts, right? No. Well, you can say, hey, let's be poly um, polyamorous. And, and you can have, and I can have as many partners as we want. Um, but the polyamorous community doesn't have any better luck with relationships than the monogamous community. They have just as many breakups. So we're not really solving anything here. Yeah, to, to me, it sounds like they simply have some variety, but they don't have better outcomes, right? Uh, well, you know, if you're going to be polyamorous, be prepared for a, a, lot of, um, a lot of time to talk because you're going to have a lot of decompression time with your partner as jealousy and all sorts of things come up. Uh, so yeah, there's that whole different it, thing that comes up. It was, it was interesting. It came up to my door, like this woman showed up and uh, said, hey, I would like to make a proposition. Um, you know, I'm, I'm into that. And would you like to join in? Mm. I said, let me run it by my wife. Mm -hmm. And my wife said, I don't know. I don't think so. Let's not bother with it. Mm -hmm. So we didn't join in. But it's interesting that it did show up. And uh, I certainly am well aware that there are multifaceted, dynamic relationships all around. Yeah. So basically what you're doing is you're solving one issue, which is the variety issue. But then other issues come up, which is jealousy and all the dynamics involved. So what could we do to suppress the polygamy and hypergamy instincts so we can um, be satisfied and excited on our own partners? 
Uh, well, the, the way that uh, the DNA does it is with phenylethylamine and oxytocin. When you're in phenylethylamine, you can't see anybody else. There's only one person in the world. It's your partner. And on oxytocin, you love them so much, you wouldn't, you wouldn't risk hurting their feelings for something you know, silly as a fling. So I've told you how to raise oxytocin. Let me tell you how to raise PEA a little bit, phenylethylamine. Um, let's see how to start this. Okay, so there's two aspects of it. One is called emotional transference. And that's but the idea behind that is if um, when they did these studies where they put two people on a roller coaster and asked them to rate each other's effectiveness before and after the roller coaster ride. And after the roller coaster ride, they're both more attracted to each other. Well, infatuation isn't just phenylethylamine. It's also uh, adrenaline. It's also dopamine. So there's a little bit of excitement and a little bit of novelty. So if you can create date night where you have a little excitement and novelty, that's why travel is so romantic or a motorcycle ride or something new and exciting and maybe just a little hint of danger, that will give a little bit of the experience of infatuation and you'll be more attracted to your partner. Now the other, uh, and this is really more for the guys, is women are attracted genetically to the strong male leader, the alpha, alpha male, right? For lack of a better term. <laughs> and in animal groups, uh, there's only one alpha male for every 20 males. The other 19 are beta, their support position. And it has to be like this because if you have too many alphas, they fight. And if you have too few, there's chaos in the truck and the pack whether it's wolves or eight great apes or whatever pack species or humans you're going to look at. And this was true for humans, right? But now that we're all one-on-one -on -one in relationships, it means 19 out of 20 women are not going to be with a man that's naturally alpha. It's naturally a leader. And if you add into that the feminizing influence of plastics and, and soy and the pot and the feminizing man-hating aspects of our social culture, which is now doing the opposite. It used to suppress women, now it's suppressing men, right? Then you don't, don't see a lot of healthy male role models. And so the women end up you know, being frustrated. And this is you know, why sometimes a woman will go to be with the guy, cheat on, on her husband with the guy across the street, you know, mowing the lawn full of muscles and sweat, but the lawnmower, even though he's a jerk, but he's an alpha jerk, it still triggers that, that, that desire, right? So let's, let me give you an example of this, right? <clears throat> Uh, let's say the woman says to the man, where would you like to go you know, for dinner? I'd like to go out for dinner tonight. And what would you like to do? Where would you like to go? And the man says, oh, darling, wherever you'd like to go is fine. Well, that's nice, but it's beta. And it's supportive. It's kind. But the woman asked the man to lead. She said, hey, you know what? I want you to, to take lead tonight and, and make some decisions. I don't feel like making a decision. You lead. And he was, so she was being feminine and receptive and he responded by being feminine. And there goes all the attraction, right? Boom, it's out. But if instead he'd said to her, you know, darling, put on that beautiful black silk dress we got. I'm gonna make reservations at the French restaurant for seven. Be ready. Okay, <laughs> that's what she wanted, right? So yeah. alpha doesn't mean that you're an aggressive jerk, right? That's the play that- No, you know, so, just, you know. just, just decise, decisive, right? It means leading when leading is appropriate in a way that works, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem is, you know, there's so few role models for what it is to be a healthy alpha leader, healthy male. And there's, you know, plenty of uh, toxic alphas, the tyrants out there. Yeah. So, yeah. so the goal was the guy had to know, wow, she's asking me to step up and lead. So he not only has to lead, but he, he has to have the perception to know that she has been uh, going to Pilates and exercising for the last few weeks and can now fit in that black dress. And she's been wanting to go to that French restaurant, but she wasn't sure if the finances could afford it. And so he also, if you're a leader, you have to have the ability to know what the right decision is, you know, for the group. And in this case, it was the group of two. So uh, that's the whole kind of um, relationship game as I see it. We've got the genetics, <clears throat> Uh, setting up arranged marriages where you don't get to meet your entire partner for several years. Um, and then, but if you understand how it's playing you towards maximum genetic diversity and not happily ever after, if you know how to stimulate a little PEA on date night with 
I mean, here's a fun thing to do. When you're walking to the French restaurant, take turns with one of you closing your eyes and walking, the other holding your hand. And the person who's got their eyes open, walk quickly and move them around so it's a little nerve wracking. It's, it's a very, it's like a little bit of something new and a little bit of something dangerous. It's, it, you'll be surprised at how it'll spice things up. Um, for the oxytocin, you know, it's groom, groom, groom. There's one other thing I need to mention, it has to do with orgasms. <clears throat> orgasms for the man are going to decrease testosterone, increase prolactin, and increase estrogen receptors. Right. Which is exactly the opposite of what a man is, right? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, women notice this. They're like the guy will just roll over and kind of fall asleep afterwards because he's lost his testosterone and he's raised his prolactin. It's knocked him out. One of the most powerful ways to raise oxytocin is carezza, which is Italian for caress. It means lovemaking without orgasm because there's an enormous number of oxytocin receptors on the sexual organs. So what it means is getting very close, but not having orgasm. And I invite the people that are watching this to experiment with this. Just say to your partner, I, I want to try something different tonight. I'm not trying to tease you, but I want to have a very long lovemaking session, but we don't finish. And I just want us to see how we feel for each other. And what you're telling your DNA is, you're kind of playing hard to get. The DNA is thinking, wow, this person's not letting me make a child with them. They must be out of my genetic, you know, uh, out of my grade. They must be above my grade. Um, out of my, oh, what's the term? Step up. Uh, yeah, you know, just, um, so by doing that, the DNA is like, wow, well, this must be a real catch, but, um, you know, I'm not qualified for them. I really have to try harder. So you can kind of trigger also a little bit of PEA with that technique too. Um, and you'll also find as a guy, if you're able to master that, you have a lot more energy in life as a general rule. If you're going to try to do this, it's you have to have a woman who's on board because you know if she's not paying attention to your breathing and slowing down when you ask her to you're going to lose it so my suggestion is if you want to try this technique let's imagine number zero is no attraction whatsoever and 10 is having an orgasm nine is you're not having an orgasm but imminent in the next 10 15 seconds eight 50 50 chance you might have one you might not when you're learning correct, so try to stay at around five for a little while, just, just so you can learn your breathing and your rhythms. And um, it's, a, it's a way to skyrocket your oxytocin levels. And as a man, if you can do this for you know, a few weeks, you're gonna find that your mental capacity, your physical strength, are, I don't think a man really knows who he is until he's gone a couple of weeks post-puberty you know, without spilling a seed and let his charge build. That's just, that's just my head on that. Well, there are some spiritual practices uh, around this, this issue, just mm -hmm. learning to uh, indeed be with a woman, be in the act, but withholding it, mm -hmm. withholding the spilling of the seed, as you called it. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah.